Hi and welcome back, friends of the Thoughtful Gaming Experience. I'm your host, Emmanuel Ken. And we are starting a new Let's Play of Torment Tides of Numenera, and this is patch 1, as you see here. Last time we showed version 000, this is version 011. So let's go ahead and start the game. Now, Torment Tides of Numenera is a role-playing game similar to the old uh, Planescape Torment. It is also, in broader sense, similar to games like Baldur's Gate or... Um, not like Icewind Dale, but it's more story-oriented. We'll be female this time. We, we were male in, in our last try. Uh, but then the safe games got... Uh, got changed and we couldn't we couldn't load up again so I'm making this new start. Your mind wakes in darkness. Aching cold sets into an unfamiliar body. A distant howling surrounds you, louder with each passing second. Insistent and invisible hands slap and tear at the membrane that protects you. And we already can see that it's running smoother. This is for patch one. So the game will be running much smoother, I expect, in retail version, the release version. This is already cool. If you're unfamiliar with the backstory, we are falling down. Your first emotion is an involuntary and formless panic. You feel you have forgotten something, something important. As if it once meant the world to you, but the details slip away as you grasp at them. You force your eyes open. Well, last time we looked at the body. Now the let's white, look around. A fleshy cocoon surrounds you. Even as you look, a minor rent in its side tears open, and the howling wind forces its way inside. The cocoon rips away, gone before you can grab it, spinning you into a dizzying tumble. You are falling, the world many kilometers beneath you. You catch a glimpse of a curved horizon, and also the ground beneath you that is approaching deceptively quickly. Above you, a small moon is slowly collapsing in upon itself. A corona of acid green and black energy playing around its edges. The wind buffets you and burns your eyes, but you don't need to see the details of the faraway ground to know you're in serious trouble. You won't survive a fall from this stratospheric height. A part of your frantic mind babbles that technically you probably fell from a thermospheric height. You struggle to stay focused as the ground rushes toward you. We'll try to stop the fall. Instinctively, you spread your arms and legs, and they respond sluggishly. You stop tumbling head over heels. Though you are still spinning laterally, that motion has calmed as well, and you have space to assess your situation, and perhaps to understand the predicament and the body in which you find yourself. Below you, you see a large landmass. A massive ocean dominates the rest of the visible globe, dotted here and there with island chains. Small moons, unusual structures, and strange machines rush past you in glittering profusion as you plummet toward the ground. Yeah, it's a cyborg world. A cyborg world of uh, magic, mystery, mayhem, and machines. That's the thing that is about it. But more we didn't find out yet. There's a lot of uh, creatures out there, very strange, a lot of people belonging to long gone peoples, uh, a lot of dying was going on there, there are realms that we cannot assess in our mind. And we've even just been to the first few areas. So. Study the world now a bit you see more. That this appears to be a huge mega continent, the only land of any size on this side of the world, at least. Great inland seas and lakes dot the land, and curiously, regular mountain ranges march up and down and across. You are falling toward what looks to be a great bay, a sprawling city perched on its shore just to the north. Further to the north and east, you see a broad plain scattered with curious structures visible even from this height. The northeastern portion of this land looks to be a desert, 
a strange blue dot like an eye in its exact center. It seems to hold a city in its watery grasp. To its west is a ring of huge mountains surmounted by enormous carved peaks spewing magma into a central catch basin. What concerns you most right now is the bay below you. It's coming at you quickly. And we'll try to slow the descent. That's fruitless. You've reached a velocity that could, without irony, best be named Terminal. You spread your arms and legs and try to catch a draft, and it looks like you'll hit the bay that's rushing toward you, unless you hit the building in its littered waters. A strange web of colors surrounds you, thrown by a figure standing on the balcony of the structure. But it is effective only at slowing your fall. You strike the building hard enough to crack its crystalline structure, and you hear one of the engines that supports it protest and howl, and the agony of the crash overcomes you, and then darkness. And if you try out, if you really try, you can die just in the first seconds like of, of this game. You fell. You remember falling toward the curve of the world. The ground leapt up to claim you. Impact, you should be dead. If so, this is a strange death. There's no peace here. And your mind aches, struggling to form simple thoughts. This doesn't seem like death, nor like any kind of life you recognize. Jumbled thoughts cloud your head as you study the empty bowl before you. Drops of liquid fall from the ceiling, spattering on the ground next to the bowl. The light from every drop is reflected in the bowl's rounded hollow, as if it hungers for that light and needs to be filled. Yet the bowl remains dry. Another drop falls from the ceiling and splashes across the pylons. Wasted. Examine the bowl. Trace your fingers over the slippery, overlapping scales that spiral up from the bottom of, of the bowl. The sharp toothed rim plucks at your skin. It's going to be tricky to move this bowl without slicing your fingers on the edge. You might have to put some effort into it. Reflected light streaks across the surface of the bowl as another droplet falls from the ceiling. We'll carefully move the bowl beneath the liquid. And it's challenging right now, so we are going to use a little bit of effort, which expands our points here, my points. Success. You carefully take hold of the bowl, avoiding the teeth on the serrated rim. With a deep breath, you move it over to the glowing pool of fallen light. glows and there's music huh? Drop by drop the bowl fills, ripples spreading over the blurred outline of your reflection. A pale blue luminescence stretches into the corners of the room. A clear radiance spills across the segmented floor, washing away the nearest shadows and pouring into your mind, melting the ragged edges of your fragmented thoughts. You are not whole, not yet but you have begun to heal from the damage done in your long fall. A voice calls out from somewhere high above, beyond the reaches of the spreading light. Hello? Oh, Skist, you're dead, aren't you? No, that can't be right. If he were dead, I would be too. Can you hear me? Oh, I can't hear nothing. anything. Are you even there? Well, if you can hear me, it means you're still alive. But you'd already know that, wouldn't you? Look, I'm just going to assume we're both alive and want to stay that way, all right? So here's what you have to do. I can't get to you, so you need to build a way up to me. I don't know how you're going to do that. I mean, this is your mind. It's not like I have a map. Ah, this is your mind. I bet your memories are down there. Find them, and you'll repair the path up to where I am. Our... Are you there? Uh, talking to myself here. I'm here. Did you say something? Was was that even you? I can't tell. It doesn't matter. Just build a path up. Then we can face this mess together and you won't be alone. I won't be alone. The voice fades until it passes into 
inaudibility. Blank, oppressive silence falls, split only by the soft hum of new pylons rising from the depths. And a wave forms in this dark matrix. The light is there. The air thickens with each step you take towards this watery orb, and whispering voices flit across one of the counters aching gaps in your mind. This must be one of the memories you were told to find. Two figures swim down the, through the orb, as though it is a fathomless ocean. One vanishes into the ebony depths before you can study it. The other, a female, seems to be struggling or perhaps drowning. You realize that, like the swimmer, you cannot breathe. Rescue the swimmer before she drowns. Moderate? Oh yeah, let's, let's put effort into it. Make it easy. Success. You plunge your hand into the orb and catch the tiny swimmer. Surprisingly strong muscles flex against your palm and the swimmer pulls you through the breach. As she does, you feel faster. Something about this place causes even your smallest choices to shape who you are. As you plunge into the water, a memory floods your mind. You stand in front of a rusted door. The air is humid and dank. You've had a moment's respite from this waterlogged hell. Bubble of stale air, your resting point. You've breathed water before, and you've lived de decades beneath the waves, but this body is an air breather, and the constant pressure has been crushing you ever so subtly. Worse, your companion's mind seems to be wandering from the task at hand. He's a genius with machines, as you well know, but now he seems distracted. The device in his hands is covered in knobs, wires and antennae. He believes it can get the two of you through the corroded door, but he is merely staring at it. Perhaps he's lost faith in his invention, but that is hardly your concern. This mission cannot be delayed. It must proceed. This is taking too long. Cast a spell, an esoteric, to fix the device yourself. You mumble a few words, drawing power from the air around you, until a solution appears in your mind. You snatch the device from his hands, rewire it and shove it back at him. Oh, he says, examining your work. Sorry, I was trying to improve the thing. He waves the device at the door, and the stale air of your bubble freshens as the door swings open. A dark hallway lies beyond, a passage that links the water-bordered cells and the aquatic viewing areas. What you sleek lies there. Moments later, you're underwater again, and your hands are closing around a strange artifact that seems somehow familiar. Over the buff pedestal, writhing and spinning as if alive. An electric current runs through your fingers as your hand crosses the vertical plane of the pedestal, and an iridescent field coalesces so fast that the wave of pressure dazes you for a moment. The rising pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the water. The guards won't be far behind. going to run. You can come back for it. They won't be able to protect it forever. The water's crystal clear around you as you kick away from the pedestal. Your companion hangs motionless in the water, too far for you to reach before the guards arrive. You stroke for the hallway through which you entered, and emerging into the air, you race for the great door. The sounds of something breaching the surface behind spur you to greater speeds, but you fear you're not fast enough. The memory begins to fade, as if you were being drawn backward through a tunnel, and you hear more pylons rising from the pit. Something is wrong. The events within the orb have settled into that gap in your mind, but the edges of it are rough, as though the memory itself is not truly yours. There is something else, a gust of sour air pulling at you, like a predator inhaling the scent of its prey 
at the far end of a dark, whispering field. Now, what's going on around here? What's this? The light around the doors frame dims and flares like a roaring fire in a high wind. No sign or symbol tells you what might be behind this enormous door. A dull chill radiates from its bronze, segmented surface. The thick metal wheel seems frozen into place. Countless scratches and wounds mar the surface of this door. Someone made a great effort to get inside, to no avail. And what's going on here? A mechanism. This orb, this memory, resembles an eye or a masked face turns to face you with cold disdain. Mechanisms spin and mesh beneath a gleaming surface and an ominous ticking begins, getting faster and faster. Two cold facts emerge from the mental gap this memory once occupied. The ticking does indeed mean that the device will soon explode and you have no one to blame but yourself. This trap is yours, built to protect the memory within. Try to remember how to open the device. Perhaps that will disarm the trap as well. well. Let's make it easy. Success. You focus, shutting out the racing ticks of the device and see hands reaching out, gently cupping the eyes, sides of the orb like an upturned face. You feel the connections in your mind increasing, strengthening. You touch the orb in the same way and the mechanisms within Grow still as the warmth of the memory races up your arms and into your mind. You stand beside a woman on a verdant crack. Beneath the two of you is a broad declivity, a flat bottomed bowl riven by a white chasm. Moss covered arches provide natural ingress and egress for the light, and a broad golden disc gleams up from the door of the valley. The self aware humanoid machines drill into the base of the cliffs below. If you were looking for a sanctuary, and you were desperately, this seems like the right place. I don't know about this, the woman says, her voice flat, neutral. Her face is turned away from you. What makes this place any more secure than the other ones we've found? We will convince her with the wisdom of our superior intellect. A slight chill enters the air as you describe the powers of the golden disk below and the possible contents of the sealed walls beneath it. She nods. So that's what your servitor machines are doing down there? You've already chosen this as the site, haven't you? She waits for your affirmation and says, All right, I'm convinced. The two of you Sketch your plans for the sanctuary, drawing schematics and architectural di diagrams. Then you descend into the valley to examine the open ground. The woman suggests having one of the servitors build a shelter for your time here. You try to draw one of the constructs away from its task, but it doesn't respond to your voice. When you lay a hand on its shoulder to reinforce your command, it whirls and strikes you across the face with inhuman speed. It turns back to its task, ignoring you. Your companion helps you rise, laughter in her eyes. It seems your construct has other ideas. What's the matter with it? Uh, hmm. We're going to use the Numenera integrated into the construct's body to overwhelm the behavior malfunction. A fog oozes into the valley as you activate the time scarred artifacts fastened to the construct's behavioral core with a sub-vocalized command. With an abrupt clack and a pulse of pleasant warmth, the device is purged the arrow and seven copper bandit spheres drop out of evenly spaced drifts in the air. Ignoring this common side effect, you give new orders to the malfunctioning construct in a firm, clear voice. Acknowledged, it obediently trundles to the site of your new shelter. The image freezes, then fades, and you feel the memory filling the gap in your mind, block by jagged block. You stagger, clutching your head. The spectral voice didn't warn you that reclaiming your memories would hurt so much. And once more, there's something else. Hairs lift, one by one, on the back of your neck. 
Something beyond this room can sense what you are doing and is hunting you. Ow, oh, that's creepy. What's going on around here? Let's talk to the glowing ball of light again. Your fingers are twitching. Your mind races. Each blink sends branching streams of white fire across the inside of your eyelids. You can't deny it. You feel stronger and sharper, more whole than when you, than when you landed here. Captive light swirls mockingly beneath the thick surface of the orb before you, obscuring shadows, memories behind it. You'll need to claim them somehow if you are to be free of this place and find your companion. Wax the shadows to the front of the glass so you can see them. Make this easy. Success. Your confidence grows. Speaking quietly, you call a slender shadow to the surface of the glass. Into the light, it is a young woman bound in chains of sorrow. She speaks quietly of a memory. You lean in closer and closer until her whispered words fill your mind. A vision of a city springs up around you, your city, in flames and under attack. Her defenders have fought and died all day, and still the attackers keep coming. They fight as if your destruction were demanded of them. They care nothing for mercy, surrender or plunder. What they want is blood. But you have brought a keen-eyed companion to the top of the tower. She has seen the way to stop the invaders. You need to get her to safety, and you need to rally your defenders. But even as you turn toward the door of the tower, two of the attackers descend from a hovering machine. You don't have time to strike at them before they land. One is brutishly large, his weapon a vibrating axe. The other is slim, sheathed in glassy armor and holding a hilt with a sizzling invisible blade. Your companion backs away. She's too young to help. Your enemies advance single file, confined by the prep parapet. Uh, we'll duck under the giant swing and attack before he can strike. You roll under the blurring arc of his axe. He's overconfident, testing you with committing without committing to the attack. Yes, he's fast, but not as fast as you are. And when he raises the great axe above his head to finish you, you're able to bury your blade under his breastplate. The blade emerges from the back of his neck, and his live blood washes over your heads. Of your hands. He falls, taking your weapon with him, and his companion attacks. Her invisible blade is far more lethal than the giant's axe. You duck as she thrusts at you and the wall behind you hisses, destroyed. Her return swing cuts through your armor, ruining your breastplate. She doesn't have to be skilled with a weapon like this. She just has to make contact. You time your attack just as she pulls it back for another strike. You barrel into her, driving her over the wall, and she drops, screaming to the ground 50 meters below. The immediate threat ended, you focus on finding a way back to your allies. You open the tower door and rush down the stairs. The door at the base of the stairs is slightly cracked, opening just a bit into the hall, and you hear more of the enemy soldiers beyond. Hmm. Crack the door open to sneak past them. You press yourself against the gleaming door, easing it open, and your breath catches in your throat as it's squeaks quietly, the sound like a bell in your memory. You pause, but the soldiers in the hall continue to talk. You push again, squeeze yourself through a narrow opening and creep down the blood-stained hall. The memory begins to fade and you find yourself back in your own body. The temples throb with the racing force of your heartbeat and the reclaimed memories blaze within you, like a bonfire on a mountain peak visible to every predator for kilometers around. A tremor rocks the floor beneath you, as though a massive fist has struck the room itself. Swaying on your feet, you see frantic movement within the borders of a mirror at the edge of the room. And we can 
continue our way. Seeing ourself. The border of this mirror is lavishly decorated with a dizzying number of interlocked symbols. Daggers, masks, paintbrushes, amulet and amulets and more. But that's nothing compared to what you see in the glass. You see a vast crowd of people, exact doppelgangers of you, shoving, arguing with and fighting each other. You are most of us are drab imitations of you, but a precious few are vivid and pull at your attention. Each of them bears an intricate pentagonal tattoo on their head. In their eyes, their actions, you see the memories you discovered within the orbs and the choices you made, shining like distant stars. Your hand twitches at your side, and though some of the bright doppelgangers ignore you, an even smaller number immediately turn to you, waiting for you to choose them and learn what you might become. A rumble shakes the room and a slow vibration spreads from the darkness below, rippling towards the ceiling. Point at the intelligent doppelganger with a furrowed brow. Holding itself erect among the pressing crowd, the doppelganger draws your attention to the cavern walls, evaluating the organic composition of the supporting beams and identifying the many uses of devices embedded in the rock. Its words tickle strange memories at the back of your head. When you return from your contemplation, the doppelganger is waiting for your decision with a knowing smile. Yes, that is how I, who I am. Gained descriptor, intelligent. Your decision rings out into the cavernous room. Awakening and unlocking vast mechanisms behind the walls, suddenly a grotesque noise rings through your shared worlds like a bell, if bells could rot. This place, your mind, is under attack. Your remaining doppelgangers scatter for the edges of the mirror and vanish. Untroubled, your chosen identity steps out of the rippling glass and into you, filling you, making you whole. The mirror fades, leaving a dark, open doorway. Take a deep breath and step through. And now we made other choices compared to the first uh, playthrough. The texts are similar but are differing in uh, small doses. And it looks better. Everything runs smoother. You can see the animations here. And they were somewhat edgy and sketchy a bit more and now they are more polished, fluent and looking great. The pinprick of light you followed in the dark passage suddenly opens wide. There was no sense of transition. One step you were in the dark, the next you were here. You're in some kind of mystic laboratory. Machines gleam all around you. Seemingly incomprehensible data swirling around them like modes of light. Five large tanks stand out each one containing a different shadowy form, none of them human. A spectral figure stands in front of you. The spectre. Everything about the spectre seems dreamlike. He's a hazy silhouette of green glass smoke, wearing stylish well-cut clothes. His jade eyes are fixed on you. His handsome, bearded face seems hauntingly familiar. Though to the best of your recollection, you've never seen him before. He claps you warmly on the shoulders. Skist, you made it! It was the voice, I guess. Listen, I know you've got a dozen questions, but we're not through the worst yet. You must have heard that thing digging in your mind by now, yeah? Well, it's on its way. I think we have a chance at surviving using these machines. That's why we are here. But you have to attune yourself to the tides. It's a process that, well, it's hard to explain, but I'll walk you through it. All right, so how do I get attuned? You see all those tanks in here? Each one's got a creature in it that's attuned to one of its tides. You need to attune, attune to them, and that will attune you to the each tide. Huh. I tried it myself while I was waiting for you, but I couldn't do anything except watch them, I suppose. That means this is your show. They're in stasis, in a kind of temporal loop. I think all you need to do is join them, hook your mind up with theirs and make a decision for them that ends the loop. You should do that what you want, by the way, not what they want. That's the whole point of this thing, to define you. 
Alright, I'm ready. Great, let's do this. So, um, with this opening chapter, this concludes our session of Thoughtful Gaming. For now, thank you for watching. If you like the videos, uh, that is great for me. <laughs> and I hope you watch again. And so, happy gaming to you. Have a good time. See you around. This is Immanuel Ken, signing out for now. <laughs>